this presentation, I'm going to show how to set up HumanIK and use it to retarget motion capture data onto a character. When working with HumanIK, the first step is teaching the solver about the hierarchy of your skeleton, and we're going to use a characterization tool to do this. The characterization tool is consistent across the media entertainment products, so if you're working in Motion Builder, you'd have the exact same user interface and workflow that we're seeing today. In the upper right-hand side of the characterization tool, I get valuable feedback as to whether or not I've met the base requirements to begin working with HumanIK. To start the characterization process, all I have to do is double-click on a bone in the characterization tool and then match it to the same bone in the Maya viewport. Notice that we match the left arm and the right arm at the same time because we had mirror matching turned on. So again, this characterization process is very fast in Maya. All I have to do is double-click on the bone and then match it to the same bone in the Maya viewport. The characterization tool also has the ability to work with naming templates. If you have a pipeline set up that uses consistent bone names, you can save a template out and reuse it. Maya ships with several templates. We have templates for HIK as well as templates for CAT and BiPED coming from 3D Studio Max. For this example, I'm going to use the IDOS template that I previously saved out. As soon as I apply that, you can see that all my matching has been filled in, including a couple of extra bones for my spine as well as some extra bones in my hands. Notice that we no longer have the red stop sign and we're now presented with a simple warning. This lets me know that I've met the base requirements for name matching on bones, but I still may have some issues that I want to address before I lock this character off. If I hover over top of the warning, you can see that Maya is unhappy about the fact that my arms aren't parallel to the x-axis. So this is pretty simple to fix. We'll just grab both of those bones, jump to our forward view, and just rotate those around until my character gets to that T-pose. As soon as I achieve that, you can see that my characterization is now valid. We can lock this character off and go to the next step, which is creating the control rig. The control rig really is where the magic happens in the human IK solver. This is Maya's full body inverse kinematics rig. It allows me to pose my character using both forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. We're going to be interacting with this rig using the character controls. The first thing that I want to do is turn off the display of the FK bones and go over to body part mode. When I select a hand in the, in the character controls, you can see that I get a visual representation as to which bones can be influenced with my current selection. It also lets me know which bones would be keyed if I hit my S key. When we key on control rigs in Maya, we're always keying FK and IK at the same time. If I grab this hand and begin moving it around the viewport, this looks like a standard IK chain in Maya. Notice what happens when I overextend it. It stops at the shoulder or the body part. At any given time, if I want to pose my character using forward kinematics, all I have to do is enter into my rotation tool. Obviously, if I want to go back to using IK, I just simply go back to the translation tool. So now that we've looked at body part, we'll go ahead and we'll turn on full body. And this is really where things get interesting. Notice in the character controls, now every bone's been stroked. So if I set the keyframe, I'd be keying everything in my body or setting a full body key. If I grab this hand and I start moving it around in full body mode, notice that it no longer has to stop at the end of the body part. It has the ability to transfer its influence all the way through that complete rig. And this is really what the human IK solver is all about inside of Maya. The control rig also has a mechanism for dealing with pinning. Any of these body parts I can pin at any given time for both translation and rotation. I can pin the character controls window as well as setting the pinning state in the viewport by simply right mouse clicking on any of the effectors. So let's unpin that hand and just drag this foot across the screen to the right. Notice that every bone in the body, upper body, moves freely because nothing's been pinned. If I go back to that hand and I right mouse click on top of it one more time and pin both translation and rotation and slide the foot across the screen, you'll see we have a very different effect. The hand's been fixed in space as well as the orientation for the wrist has been locked because we've pinned both translation and rotation. So obviously if we unpin that, we'll go back to that previous kind of state that we had. So that's really what the control rig's all about, and obviously if I wanted to do traditional keyframing on my character, I could just start laying down keys and animating them. For this example, what we're going to do is we're going to retarget some motion capture data onto this character. If we zoom out, you can see that I have another character in my scene, and this guy has some motion capture on him. If we play this back, what we've got is a guy that kind of walks around this hovercraft and basically tries to get onto it. So what we want to do is we want to have this character's movement transferred onto our hero character that we've been working with. And this is very fast to do inside of Maya. All I have to do is change the source. So instead of having that character being dragged around by the control rig, I'm going to switch its input to become the mocap character. As soon as I do that, you can see that the retargeting's happened in real time on the fly. If we play this back, obviously it's already taken care of everything for us. The thing that's interesting to notice here is that these skeletons are actually different hierarchies, and the sizes are different. And the retargeter can handle these differences because everything is starting off from that characterization that we did. So we're setting our characters up in that T-pose and taking a snapshot, and that's how we can seamlessly transfer any animation from one character to another character. There's a couple of other things that we want to look at really quickly. The retargeter has the ability to deal with characters regardless of their scale. So if we take our character and we scale it down, 
what Maya is going to do is it's going to adjust the length of this character's travel to match those shorter limbs. And this is great for certain situations, but in a lot of examples we're going to want to make sure that our character is actually reaching the world position. Like when this guy comes and gets on this hover bike, regardless of the size of his limbs, I want to make sure that his leg actually goes back there and touches that back peg. So let's look at how we can deal with that inside of Maya. What Maya is trying to do by default when we first set up a retarget is match join angle, so it's more biased to the FK. I'm going to go ahead and dock my character controls on the left hand side. We'll bring up the HIK properties for this retarget and we'll look at a couple of things here. So by default it's trying to match these join angles and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on match source. Now what match source is going to do is it's going to allow me to spe specify whether or not any of these body parts are trying to match the world position of that original retarget. Notice that my character's feet are green circles. His reach and translation for both of the feet have been turned up to a value of 1. So as soon as I turn on match source, that character's feet are no longer going to be as concerned about matching join angle. They're actually going to try to go out there and match the world position. Basically what we've done is we've said use the IK chain that runs down that leg and make its end effector try to match the overall position of that original motion capture take. And I can do this for any of the body parts in my character. If my guy's really small, I can also use the human IK solver to make sure that that body part has the ability to reach its end position. So notice on his hand I've cranked up translation 100% but it still isn't able to totally reach that end target because that limb's too short. If I go and I start to dial in a little bit of pull, what this does is it allows the retargeter to use that human IK algorithm to transfer the energy past the shoulder, past the body part, and influence a whole hierarchy of my rig to start to achieve that pulled state. So it's really powerful that we're layering all of this retargeting information on top of that human IK solver. So if we go ahead and we crank this hand up and we play this back, obviously this is a, it's a pretty ridiculous example of what a retarget could look like, but it really illustrates the power and the flexibility of the retargeting system inside of Maya. So let's go ahead and get our character scaled back up. There's a couple of other things that we want to address really quickly. We'll just zero out that arm and we'll zero out that arm here. As my character walks around here, you'll notice that even though we're matching world position, we still got a couple problems with his feet. If I scrub back here, you'll see that his feet are actually passing through that ground, so it's not really uh, looking locked to the ground plane because this character's uh, geometry is a little bit deeper than the original take. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to that HIK properties node and just adjust the floor contact system and actually turn the floor contact system on to fix that. So now you can see that foot is rised up. So now what we have is we've got our character being retargeted in real time on the fly. We have the bottom half of the legs trying to match world position and we're using the feet control system to kind of push those guys up. And what I want to do is I want to start to out modify the overall effect of this motion capture to add some tweaks or some variations to it to make it tie into the hierarchy of that spaceship. So what we're going to do is we're going to get that original control rig back with all of this motion capture data transferred onto it. So this is a very fast baking process inside of Maya. So what Maya is doing is it's going through and it's transferring that information back onto that control rig which will give me the full power of that you know human IK system to pose my character using both FK and IK and it's essentially sampling um, every single frame and writing a key for both forward kinematics and inverse kinematics on that rig so when it's done you can see that we have this dense sample data notice that our input now is no longer the motion capture care we're back to the control rig because that control rig now has the animation on it so what we're going to do is we're going to use auxiliary effectors to help us tie this character into the hierarchy of the spaceship. Let's clean up our display a little bit. We really don't need to see the joints anymore so we can hide those guys. And we can get rid of our attribute editor and just go to our channel box. So any of the changes that I make to this motion capture data that I'm going to layer on top of this control rig, I want to do on a new animation layer. So I want them to be non-destructive in nature. So we'll go ahead and we'll create a new animation layer for that control rig. And I'm going to find a frame where it looks like his hand may grab onto that handlebar. And I guess it's a good idea to turn off the animation for that spaceship while we do this. So when that hand kind of comes in and it looks like it might sit down on that handlebar, what I want to do is I want to create a new auxiliary effector. What an auxiliary effector is, is it's basically a new IK chain. I'm going to say, you know what, I want to now use this IK chain to pose this hand. So as I move that around, obviously both FK and IK I can use to start posing that hand. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to parent the overall position of this newly added effector into the hierarchy of the spaceship. So that when I move that spaceship around, it goes along for the ride. The other thing that I want to do is I want to take this effector and add it into the, my animation layer so that all I have to do is hit my S key to keyframe the translation and rotation reach ability. If we zero this out, actually we'll leave it up here and we'll let my character walk around, you'll see that what the hand's trying to do is it's trying to reach that effector regardless of what frame I'm on. So really what we want to do is we want to animate the overall influence of that effector up on a given frame. 
So we'll zero it out and have it not influence it at all until we find a frame where it looks like it may want to suck it down. So right about there, I think that hand should be influenced by that effector. So we'll put those values up to a value of 1, we'll hit the S key, and then we'll just bleed this back off about 50 frames, and we'll keyframe that. So now I've got my character using the original motion capture data as he kind of walks in here, and then around frame 140 to 155, he starts to transition on, and now that auxiliary effector is what's controlling the overall position of his hand, and you can see that it's nice and grounded on that handlebar. So we want to do the exact same thing for this backhand. We'll just go ahead and we'll create an auxiliary for that. So we'll say create auxiliary effector. With that auxiliary effector selected, I'll just uh, position it slightly closer to the handlebar. We'll parent it into the hierarchy of the ship. And we'll also add it into the animation layer really quickly. And we'll just simply uh, set a keyframe of it on there. And we'll just bleed that back a few frames and zero out those values and set that keyframe one more time. And now we can turn on the animation for the ship, and you can see that as that ship sort of rocks around there, those hands are totally going along for the ride of it. Notice that his hand's pulling off the handlebar right there a little bit as he starts to lean back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to influence a little bit of pull that lets that body part, you can see that arm's basically locked in length, I'm going to add a little bit of pull in there to let that body part pull down through that whole hierarchy of the human IK solver to start to let that limb, limb reach its, its destination. So we'll turn off the animation for the ship one more time, and I'm just going to run a simple script that will automatically add a couple of effectors on the feet, the shoulders, and the waist. So now when we play this back, basically what we have is a character that's going to be completely tied into the ship. So as the ship takes off and zooms away, you can see there goes my character along for the ride, because we have all of these auxiliaries that basically became the dominant force in controlling where that control rig is going. So I hope that really shows you guys the power of working with Human IK inside of Maya. The setup process is very fast, and once you've done that, you have this extremely elegant rig to begin working with. And the auxiliary effectors give us that extra flexibility that we need to start to really push this motion capture data right to where we want it.